Well, welcome, uh, welcome back, everybody. I'm glad to have you back here at the uh, Learn to Study the Bible group. We're on week two of eight, and so this week we're actually going to start delving into the process of studying the Bible. So I'm excited about that. If you missed last week, we recorded it. It's online. You can go on our YouTube channel. You can go on our church website. You can go on our app. Um, and you can go and rewatch that, but we basically talked about the history of how we actually got our Bibles and the process, the seven stops, so to speak, that the Bible took from God to us. So go back and watch that if you didn't get to catch it. Um, but without further ado, uh, tonight we're going to begin the process of actually learning how to effectively study our Bible. So let's go ahead and open our time in prayer. Lord, we want to come before you tonight, and we want to be students who are rightly dividing the word of truth, Lord, learning how to properly handle your word, which is precious and holy and so important to our lives. Uh, Lord, we know that we're not able to truly accept or understand the words of Scripture without your intervention, without the Holy Spirit. So I just pray tonight, Holy Spirit, that you would be at work in our hearts as we seek to learn how to study your word. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, there are essentially three uh, essential steps to effectively studying the Bible. And these three steps are quite simple. Number one is to observe. And in this step, we're asking the question, What does the text say? What does it say? Step two is to interpret. And in this step, we're asking the question, what does it mean? What does the text mean? And finally, we must apply, application. And in this step, we're asking, what should I do? Observe, interpret, apply. It's a process called inductive Bible study. And this is the way that you effectively study the Bible. Now, tonight and next week, we're going to dedicate our time to step number one, which is observe, observation. And so I wanted to share a short story tonight to kind of kick us off, but I actually found a video that illustrates this story a lot better than I would tell it to you. It's from John Piper, Desiring God, Um, so they get the credit for this video, Uh, but go ahead and play it. A student approached him, curious about scientific observation. Very well, said the professor as he pulled out a huge yellow jar. Take this fish and look at it. Eventually, I'll test you. The student took the fish and began to observe it. He looked at it, studied it. After 10 minutes, he thought he'd seen everything that could be seen. He searched for the professor but he was nowhere to be found. So he kept looking at the fish. 30 minutes, an hour, two hours passed. He was turning it over, looking it in the eyes, behind, beneath, above. What have you learned? Asked the professor when he returned. The student rehearsed it all. The pores of the head, fleshy lips, lidless eyes, the lateral line, the spinous fin, the forked tail. The professor seemed disappointed. You haven't looked very carefully. You haven't even seen one of the most obvious features. Keep on looking. The student wanted nothing more to do with the fish. He was miserable. But he wanted to please the professor, so he looked and looked. Slowly, he discovered one new feature after another. Soon time began to fly by as the student observed that fish, seeing all kinds of things he'd never noticed before. He realized just how right the professor had been. After another hour, he returned and heard a new list of observations. That's good, but that's not all. Go on, keep looking. And so for three long days, he put that fish before the student's eyes, forbidding him to study anything else repeating the same chorus each time, look, look, 
look. We have something far more valuable to explore and study and look at. The simple habit of looking at the Bible will change your life and lead you to the greatest beauty in the world. If we look long enough, with enough care, we will see things we never dreamed possible to see. Give yourself daily to look and look and look at God's Word. Don't let go or walk away until you have seen more of Him. You will be amazed by the wonders you will find. Yes, so the point is this. Look, look, look again. And that is the secret to effective Bible study. Let me repeat that again. The secret to effective Bible study is to look, look, and look again. See, most of the time when we sit down to study the Bible, uh, we're already trying to jump to the final phase of our inductive Bible study, the application process. And we're asking the question, what should I do? Or sometimes we're jumping to the second step, And we're asking the question, what does this mean? And the problem is that we haven't done our due diligence in the first step, which is simply to look at the text and observe what does it say. And this is the number one reason that people struggle to understand the Bible, because they don't take the time to simply observe what it says. So much of what we need to know from Scripture is just sitting there, right there on the surface. And we're glossing over it either because we're reading through too fast, we're reading without truly looking, or we're reading um, and trying to find some sort of hidden meaning deep beneath the text. But the more time we spend simply looking and observation, the better and easier of a time we're going to have interpreting and applying Scripture. So if you do your due diligence in this first step, steps two and three are going to be a lot easier. So over the next two weeks, we're going to look at the text of Scripture. Now, tonight, we're going to get into some things to look for. Um, And a couple of ground rules as we begin making uh, observations upon Scripture. As you're looking at the Bible, number one, anything counts as an observation. If it catches your eye, make note of it. If it causes you to have a question, make note of it. Secondly, at, the, at this point in the process, as we begin observing Scripture, try to resist the temptation to interpret or to apply anything to yourself. I know that sounds bad as a pastor to say, don't apply the Bible to your life at this point. But that's what I'm telling you. At this point, resist the temptation to interpret or apply. Make this time simply about looking. We want to be like Sherlock Holmes, right? Walking into a crime scene, and we're observing things, and we're seeing the small details, and we're seeing the big picture, and we're observing the things other people are glossing over. We're going to notice things that other people view as insignificant. No detail is going to be too small for us to observe, and nor is there going to be a detail too large. We want to observe the forest and also the trees, everything. All right, with that being said, Tonight, I want to go over 10 or 11 things um, just to kind of get us started uh, to look for when you're studying the Bible. Whenever you start reading Scripture, here are some things that we need to look for, and I'm going to kind of interactively show some of these things to you as well. So with that being said, the first one is repetition of words. We want to look for words that are being repeated or phrases that are being repeated repeated because this might give us a clue as to the key theme of a verse or a passage. All right, so I'm going to switch over here. I've got uh, a couple of passages up on the screen here to show you, and I'll just kind of zoom in so you can see a little bit better. But right here we have Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 through 6, and I just want you to notice as we read through the repetition of this word. It says, there is one body and one spirit just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. Over here, one Lord, 
one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all, who is over all and through all and in all. Now, I mean, if you just look at that one passage, we have this word one. Can you see that okay? You may need some glasses. We have this word one seven times spoken in this one passage, right? So that tells us a little bit something about what this scripture is about. It has to do with oneness. It has to do with unity. Uh, look at 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. He says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes, the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. So the word world spoken six times. It gives us a clue as to what the author is trying to get across to us. He's repeating himself because he's got something important to say. So look for repetition of words. Now, the second thing that we want to look for uh, are contrasts. We want to look for contrasts. So look for contrasting words or ideas, things that are kind of set up uh, as Uh, opposites to each other. Generally, one half of a contrast will shed light on the meaning of the other half of the contrast. So we want to pay special attention to these. So let's go back to our iPad view here. Here's Proverbs 15.1. It says, a soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Now, do you see what's being contrasted there? There's actually two things being contrasted. First of all, you have a soft answer and a harsh word, right? These two things are being pitted against each other here, uh, so to speak. And then also, you have the effects of what those things do. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. So you have these two contrasts. And as we understand one of them, it's going to help us to understand the other one, because the other one's going to be opposite. Let's look at 1 John here again. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So a few things to be contrasted here to notice. Number one is light and darkness, right? God is light, and in him there's no darkness at all. And notice that in this case, it's speaking about the nature of God, right? Now, it then goes on to say that if we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness... We lie and do not practice the truth, but if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship. So another thing being contrasted, again, this picture of light versus darkness, but now it's not being applied to the nature of God, it's being applied to walking. It's being applied to walking or the way that we live. Um, So we want to look for contrast. Those are going to be big helps as we're trying to study scriptures. Uh, All right, next one. We want to look for comparisons. Now, while a contrast is focusing on the differences, a comparison obviously is focusing on the similarities, right? And comparisons also shed light on the meaning of a verse, a passage, a phrase, or a word. So you want to switch back over. Now, we just did this passage, uh, but I wanted to show you how two things are being compared here. It says, if we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses from all sin. Notice here how the nature of God, God being light and dark, is being compared with the manner in which we should walk. Darkness being, there's no darkness in God and his nature, And so we should not walk in darkness. They're being compared. 
Uh, if we look at Proverbs 25, verse 26, it says like, right? Usually that can be a little indicator word for us. Let me change back to a brighter color here. Like a muddied spring or a polluted fountain is a righteous man who gives way before the wicked, right? So the righteous man who does this is being compared to a polluted fountain or a muddied spring, right? The author's trying to communicate something to us by making a comparison. Uh, Matthew chapter 5 says, you are the light of the world, right? A city set on a hill that cannot be hidden. So here we're being compared, light of the world, city set on a hill that cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, ding, 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 that's a comparison, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So this whole let your light shine before others, being compared to basically a, a light that's on a lamp, right, that's public and visible, or a, a city that's set on a hill that cannot be hidden, right? Everybody can see it. So he's trying to draw a comparison between how he wants us to be and some word pictures that he's given to us. So look for comparisons in the scriptures, Winch this out? Like, oh, enlarge it. So there you have a couple of the contrasts, or a comparisons, I'm sorry. Let's go to the next one. So the next thing we want to be looking for is lists. Lists. Two, uh, more than two things that are itemized we can count as a list. So lists are going to help us to identify uh, the progression of the author's thought process. Because when we're studying the Bible, what we want to do is we want to get into the mind of the author. We want to understand their flow of thought. What was Paul thinking as he wrote this? I want to follow his argumentation. I want to follow his thought process. And a lot of times lists will help us identify the progression of an author's thought process, or they'll help us to identify ideas that are related to each other. So lists are important, and we want to notice about lists, is there a significance to the order of things? Has the author chosen to order things in a specific way, or is there a significance perhaps to the length of the list? Is he, is he trying to communicate something through the, the brevity or the breadth of the list? So if we look over here at Galatians chapter 5, uh, verses 22 and 23, this is a pretty well-known passage. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. So there you have a list of, what is it, seven? I should know this, the fruits of the Spirit. Nine. You have a list of nine things lined up right there uh, that are all related to each other, right? And they're all pointing back to this. They're all related to this idea right here. So that is something that we want to observe. Another thing here, 1 John chapter 2, verse 16, sometimes it's ideas or larger phrases that uh, comprise a list. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. So there we have a list of three things. Psalm chapter 1, verse 1. This is a, a, an interesting list because it has a progression to it. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, there's one, nor stands in the way of sinners, there's two, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. Now notice here the progression of these verbs, walks, stands, sits. So walking being something that is more active, standing being something that you begin, you know, slowing down, and then finally you're sitting. 
there's a progression. You're becoming more set in your ways. So he's trying to communicate something through this process, walking, standing, and sitting. Let's go to the next one. Cause and effect. We want to keep our eyes out for when a, a, an author in Scripture is trying to state a cause and then tell us the effect that that cause will have, right? So if we look at Proverbs chapter 15, verse 1, we read, A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. So here we have two, actually. A soft answer, that's the cause, right? What does it do? What's the effect that a soft answer has? It turns away wrath. Then he says, but a harsh word, there's the cause, stirs up anger. Here's the effect, right? So we're looking for cause and effect. Another uh, well-known passage, Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is uh, is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So, again, a few different ones here. The wages of sin, or actually more specifically, sin, right? Sin is the cause, the effect that it has, or the wages that it pays out, is death. The free gift of God, however, cause, is eternal life. Effect. So we want to be looking for these. One more. John 3, 16, a, a verse that we know very well. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. So again, here you have a few. God so loved the world. That's a cause. What did that cause him to do? Give his only son. That's an effect. That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Whoever believes in him, cause, should not perish, but have eternal life. So this actually has two effects to it. Not perishing and uh, eternal life. So be on the lookout for causes and effects because they help us understand the way things work, the way that God has set things up. Let's go to the next one. Number six, we're looking for figures of speech. Figures of speech. The biblical authors will often use word pictures, right? Uh, they'll use uh, illustrations, images, to convey an idea to us more vividly, uh, to encourage us to use our emotions, our senses, our imaginations to Think about what they're saying. They're inviting us to contemplate what they're speaking about whenever they use a figure of speech. So whenever we see any words that aren't being used in a literal sense, and I know a lot of times we say, oh, well, I interpret the Bible literally. And what we mean by that is, you know, we're trying to actually understand what it says. But there is imagery, right? There are words being used. Um, that are not meant to be taken literally, but are meant to be a word picture, so to speak. So when we come across these, we want to pause and try to imagine in our minds, what is the author trying to convey? Why didn't they just use, why did they just say it how it is? Why did they give us this figure of speech or this word picture to use? Right, so here's a few examples. Psalm 119, 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet. And a light to my path. Now, okay, if you guys have your Bibles in here right now, do any of them light up? Literally. Are any of them a lamp? No, they're not. Do they light your feet up? What does that have to do? Do they light up some sort of path that you're walking on, a literal path in the woods? No. We have these words because they're figures of speech. I always like to put F-O-S, figure of speech, whenever I see one of these. So what is he trying to communicate through these pictures? Well, a lamp and a light, they, uh, you know, bring illumination. They, they help us to see. 
Uh, really, I'm kind of breaking my rule here because that really falls more into the interpretation category. Uh, but we would just want to observe, hey, there is a, a figure of speech being given here. Lamp and a light, feet and path. These are figures for our way in life. Right? And these right here are figures to describe the illuminating and guiding effect of God's word. So figures of speech. Matthew chapter 6, verse 3. We're actually, I've been studying this passage this week for our, the Sunday message. When you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Now, are any of us literally capable of this? Can any of us literally keep our left hand from knowing what our right hand is doing? No, it's a figure of speech. Jesus is trying to communicate uh, in vivid imagery the uh, necessity of secrecy, the necessity of discreetness uh, when it comes to our giving um, and what is motivating our giving. Uh, Look at Psalm chapter 84, verse 11. The Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. Now, God is not a literal sun. We don't worship the sun, do we? God is not a literal shield. No, these are figures of speech meant to uh, set our imaginations on fire, so to speak, and vividly portray a truth that the author is trying to get across. So take note when you see those figures of speech. Maybe write a little FOS next to those. Let's go to the next one. Conjunctions, right? Conjunction, junction, what's your function? Hooking up phrases and clauses and words. You know, that, I love that song uh, because conjunctions are so overlooked, and yet I can't tell you, I cannot stress to you enough how important these are whenever we're trying to study the Bible. Right? These are connecting words that tie words, phrases, and sentences together. They're like glue holding together uh, the, the thoughts and the sentences and the phrases of the biblical authors. And a lot of times, we gloss right over them. We think that, oh, that's not an important word. Like, I'm looking, you know, a lot of us are looking for the words like propitiation. That's got to be an important word. I'm going to circle that one right there. We skip right over the words like and, but, or, Don't skip over these, but rather take note of these. And here's a few conjunctions you want to pay special attention to. The word and, right, is like a chain. It's like a chain link that connects similar uh, ideas together, or it it speaks of continuity. It helps us to understand that a thought is being continued. And that's really useful to us because sometimes when we're reading paragraphs, it'll be like, Jesus is talking about something, and then all of a sudden, it kind of seems like he's talking about something else, but the two things are connected by the word and, which kind of signals us, hey, these two things are related, they're connected. The word but, I heard Gloriana the other night say the holy but whenever she was talking about uh, Abraham and, and his story with Isaac, right? But is a contrast word. It's indicating a shift. It's indicating to us a contrast, which that helps us out when we're looking for contrasts, right? If we were to go back and look at those passages earlier of contrast, you would see the word but in those. So we want to look for the word but, right? Therefore, or the word so, they often present a conclusion based on a previous argument. It's often signaling, all right, I've been saying all of this, and here now is the conclusion. Here is the main conclusion idea. Here is what you should take from what I've just said. So whenever we see a therefore, right, the rule that you might have heard before is we always look backwards to see what it's there for. The word for usually indicates some sort of causality. It's like the word because, you know, I am this height for, you know, I have short parents, right? It indicates some sort of causality, also, we want to look out for words like or, indicating, you know, words that are tied together, since, rather, likewise. Some of these are time-indicating words. Some of these are uh, words that signal us to a comparison, like the word like-size, uh, likewise, or a contrast, like the word nor. Just keep your eyes out for conjunctions. So let's look at some of these together. 
Romans 6.23, again, we already looked at this. For, now what's that going to, that's telling me, hey, this is a cause word. This is a causality word. I'm going to look back to see what's connected to this, right? This is telling me to look backwards. For the wages of sin is death, but, okay, so that's telling me there's a contrast present here. The free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So what's being contrasted here, right? Death and life, the wages of sin and the free gift of God, and the word but is signaling to us that there's a bunch of ideas being contrasted there. Second Timothy chapter 1, all right, there's a ton in this, so we're gonna, I'm just going to try and show you how his flow of thought breaks down in this passage. 2 Timothy 1, verses 5 through 8, Paul says, I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, all right? So obviously, grandmother and mother, they're connected here by this word and. It's kind of a little chain link that's telling us that there are similar things happening, similar ideas. And, so he's continuing now his thought. His flow of thought is continuing on, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. What dwells in him as well, right? A sincere faith, the faith that dwelt in his grandmother Lois and Eunice. Then he says, for this reason, again, we're looking back when we see that word for, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands for, right, it's, giving a, it's telling us, look, this is, this is the reason why I want you to do this. This is the reason I want you to fan into the flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Because God gave us a spirit not of fear but of power and love and self-control. Got those chain links showing us, hey, there's a list here. These ideas are related. They're connected. Also, we have this word, but, contrasting power, love, and self-control with fear. Therefore, what's it there for, right? He's concluding an argument now that is based on everything that he's just said. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor, continuity word there, conjunction, of me, his prisoner, It's tying together Paul and his Lord. But, contrast, share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, right? So you can kind of see how those words are connecting all of his thoughts together, all of the sentences and the phrases and the clauses. They're all being connected together by these conjunctions, all right? Now, I'm not going to go through all the conjunctions in this verse. I just wanted to show you how big of a deal a tiny little word can be. This is Ephesians 2, 1 through 5. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind, all right, so we you know, could observe, hey, that was pretty negative, right? Those are all pretty bad things, but that's a huge but. But God, <laughs> right, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with, Jesus, with Christ. So in, our, in actuality, in our real-life experience, You know, we owe our entire salvation and being made alive with Christ to this but, in a sense, right? Because God, he saw the condition that we were in, and he decided to do something opposite, a contrast, right? He decided to be rich in mercy because he had great love for us, even when we were dead in trespasses, so he made us alive with Christ. That word is the hinge of this whole passage, but, all right, let's go to the next thing now. Verbs, 
we want to look for verbs. Now, verbs, obviously, are where all the action is at, right? Uh, but verbs can be a little bit tricky, and I'll be honest with you. Sometimes I, I, get all, I struggle a little bit with de- deciphering which verb is, you know, which, is it passive, is it active, which tense is it? But we want to pay a- attention to a-, a few different things when it comes to verbs. Number one, the tense, right? So the difference between saying, I went, I go, I will go. Is it past, present, or future tense? That's going to be pivotal in our understanding of some passages, maybe describing, um, you know, something that has happened in the past, like our justification. So we're understanding, hey, God has already saved me, past tense. Um, And so when Paul's talking about the way that I'm living now, he's not talking about how I'm going to be saved because I've already been saved in the past. Uh, Or how about active versus passive verbs, right? Active verbs describe an action that a subject does. So like, Bill hit the ball, right? That's an active verb because Bill is the one doing the hitting. But a passive verb describes an action that is being done to the subject. So like, Bill was hit by the ball, right? In that uh, example, Bill wasn't the one doing the hitting. He was the one getting hit. The ball was hitting him. So the verb was acting passively as it relates to Bill. Uh, Imperative verbs are commands, Uh, And they're really important because they're usually signaling God's commands to us. So like when Jesus says, go, make disciples, right? He's commanding us to do something. It's an imperative verb. So let's look at a few uh, examples of verbs here in the the Scripture. So Colossians 3.1, if then you have been raised, all right, I'm sure this entire thing, I don't necessarily know that that's all considered a verb, but for the the purpose of our study, have been raised, right? Have been, that tells us that it's past tense. I put that on here. It's not actually in the Bible. And then, (laughs) have been raised. I wish it was like that, right? Like God just had all these little like clues for us in here. No, he wants us to go mine this out ourselves. You have been raised. Did you do the raising? No, the raising was done to you. Therefore, it's passive, Right? So it's a past tense and a passive verb. Uh, therefore, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek. All right, there's another verb for us. And this is a present tense verb. It's not saying that you have sought in the past. It's not saying do this in the future. It's saying right now, seek, present tense, active, because it's not being done to me. I have to go and do this. Right? I have to go and do this. So that tells me it's active, and it's a command, so it's imperative, right? It's an imperative verb. Seek the things that are above where Christ is seated, right? This verb is referring back to Christ. It's a present verb, right? He's not going to be seated in the future. He's not waiting to take his throne. Right now, he's seated, present. You can see why that's so important to understand. He's seated on his throne right now, and it's not something that's being done to him. It's something that he is doing, so it's active, right? He's seated at the right hand of God. So that can get a little bit tricky sometimes, but just take note of the tense, right? Take note of if it's an imperative and if it's active or passive, and also try to identify who it's talking about, right? This verb relates to Christ. This verb relates to the person who he's calling you, which would be us in this case. So try to note who the verbs are being applied to. Look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11. In him we have obtained, right? We have obtained. So there's a, a verb. Now, did we do anything in this, or has it been given to us? It's been given to us, right? We have obtained it. We didn't do the obtaining our, ourselves. It's passive and it's past tense. We have obtained an inheritance having, be, having been predestined. I didn't predestine myself. It's passive. It's past tense. Happened in the past. According to the purpose of him who works all things. Now, this is speaking of him, right? Whoever this is, which we know is God. It's something he's actively doing. He didn't, this wasn't done to him. 
and it's present tense, right? It's something that he's continually doing according to the counsel of his will. Genesis chapter 3, verse 3, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. That's an example of a passive when he's speaking to Abraham. Uh, It's something the families of the earth, us, it's happening to us. We didn't do this ourselves, so it's passive. And when he was speaking this to Abraham, he was saying, shall be. It's yet future. Hasn't happened yet, right? So we want to look for the verbs that are the tenses. We want to look for the active, passive, the imperatives, and we want to know who they're applying to. All right, let's go to the next one. We want to look for pronouns and, and names, really. So these are kind of the people that are involved in the passage um, that we're looking at. They're words like I or we or he, she, they, you. And they all identify um, the main character, so to speak, of our story. Story. So we want to connect them back to the antecedent, which just means we want to figure out who they're talking about. right? We want to figure out who the pronouns are referring to. So let's look at some of these. Philippians chapter 1, uh, verses 27 through 30. He says, only let your, there's a pronoun, who's that referring to? Well, if we were to look in the context of our passage, we'd understand it's referring to the Philippians who are, you know, the the Christians that Paul is writing to. Now, so if I were just to kind of like survey this really quick, you could kind of draw a line here and see every time your or you, right, is being referred to, it's talking about the Philippians. So we want to know who it's talking about. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. There's another person who's involved in all this. Let's give him a different color. Christ. So that whether I, now who is I? See if I can get a, This is speaking of Paul, right? Whether I come and see you, again, that's looking back to the Philippians, or am absent, I, there's Paul again, may hear of you, that's Philippians, that you, Philippians, are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, uh, (coughs) striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. So if I kind of skip ahead, if I kind of skip ahead, not frightened any, anything by your opponents. So there's a new person being introduced here, the opponents. This is a clear sign to them. Who does that refer to? That's referring to the opponents of the Philippians. This is a clear sign to them of their, again, destruction, but of your, the Philippians' salvation, and that from God. Now we have another person who's been introduced to us in this passage, and that from God. For it has been granted to you, Philippians, that for the sake of Christ, you, Philippians, should not only believe in him, that is Christ, right, but also suffer for his, that's Christ's, sake, engage in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. So still a couple more down there, but you get the point, right? They, you want to kind of figure out who these words are going back to. Luke chapter 15. Let me show you why it's important in this passage. It says, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear him. So we've got tax collectors and sinners. They're one group. They're connected by this word, and. They're all drawing near to hear him. We know that's Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled. They're a different group. Pharisees and the scribes, connected by this word, and, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. So he, Jesus, told them this parable. Now, who's the them looking back to? The Pharisees and the scribes. Now, why is that important? Well, Jesus goes on to tell the parable of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the prodigal son. All of those are looking back to this little scene that Luke set up for us. And whenever you read the parable of the prodigal son, usually you just focus on the one son that ran away, right? That's who we think about. But really, the parable is actually about two sons, and the whole reason Jesus told it is to basically rebuke the Pharisees and the scribes because they were like the second son. So that tells us in our minds, we need to give more attention to what Jesus is saying about the second son because the whole reason he told the parable was because he was talking to a bunch of second sons. 
the Pharisees and the scribes. That's because we looked at this pronoun and we identified who it looked back to, the Pharisees and the scribes. So you see the importance of identifying the pronouns and who they apply to. All right, with just a couple more here. Let's look at the definite and indefinite articles. So these are, there's only three of them in English. They're the words the, an, and a, right? You don't think they're that important, but they are. Why? Because the definite article, that's the word the, all right, is used before a noun to indicate that the identity of the noun is known to the reader. Uh, Basically, when the word the is there, we're talking about something specific. The word a or an is used before a noun that's more general or when its identity is not known. All right, so let me give you the example. It's just easier to show you than to try and explain this. Hebrews chapter 10 says, Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Now, what does that tell us right there, that word the in front of the word day? What that tells us is that we're not just talking about any day, right? We're talking about a specific day. We're talking about a day that is different from other days. And that's what we understand just from that little word, the, the definite article. Let's look at another example here. Then Jesus was led up by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Now, if this said he was led by a spirit, how would that change the meaning of the text, right? We might think this was a demonic spirit leading Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. But no, it tells us he was led by the spirit, the definite article. Well, that's telling us that this isn't just any spirit, right? That is a specific spirit, and if we were to look back through the scriptures, we would understand that is the Holy Spirit. So then we have to interpret all that it means that the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to get tempted by the devil. That's a whole other thing, right? But the word the is indicating something specific. So be attentive to those things, okay? Here's our last one for tonight. And it's who, what, where, when, and why. All right, it's just kind of a, a good summary to, if you, know, if you only have time to sit down and ask a few questions of the text, this is like the detective, Sherlock Holmes, when he's walking into the crime scene, right? Who, what, when, where, and why. So, for example, who are the characters in the story, right? Who is talking? Who is being spoken to? Who's the audience? What? What is the subject that's being discussed? Do any words jump out as being indicators of what the passage is about? What's happening? Or the word when? At what point in time is this taking place? Are there time indicators? Is there something future or past being described? Where? Where is this taking place? Right? Are there other important locations involved? And why? Is, there, is this passage an answer to a question? Has, uh, like, for example, in the example I gave you about the parable of the prodigal son, there's a big why there. Jesus is telling it in response to the scribes and the Pharisees, right? That's why he's telling it. Why do these characters of the story find themselves in this situation? So just looking at this few verses in the book of Joshua, when Joshua, right, that's the who, was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked. All right, so a couple things, just in that first verse. When, right? That's giving us a time indicator. When did this happen? It happened when Joshua was by Jericho. Where did it happen? By Jericho, right? Already we're understanding things about the text just by asking these simple questions. He lifted up his eyes and looked. Well, there's a what. That's something that Joshua did. And behold, a man was standing before him with his sword drawn in his hand. So now we have a new person we're introduced to, another who. And he was standing before him with his sword drawn in his hand, and Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? And he said, No, but I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Okay, well, this would explain he's the commander of an army. 
why he has his sword drawn, right? So there's the answer to a why question. So you can go through all day and look for that kind of stuff. You know, I'm not going to go through the whole thing for the sake of time, but we want to be looking for who, what, when, where, and why, all right? So I was going to have us all go through Acts chapter 1, verse 8 together, but for the sake of time, I'm going to skip ahead. Um, and I, I want us to have a little time where we get to practice some of this stuff. So um, hopefully you wrote down those things to keep in mind. Uh, on your sheet that I've given you, you have Romans 12, 1 and 2 before you. So just take about 10 minutes, and I want, to, I want you to see how many observations you can find in 10 minutes. And you can use these things we've talked about as kind of a, a list of things to look for. But just remember, anything goes, right? Anything that catches your eye, just mark it down. You don't have to have the answers to it. Just observe. Just look. See if you can find at least 30 in the next 10 minutes. All right. It's been 10 minutes. So let's look at this together. I love seeing everybody's head still down, right? There's always more to observe. Uh, but let's look at this together, and I'm just going to have you guys kind of call out to me some of the things that, that you saw. So I, I heard, we're doing Romans. Yeah, we just have time for the Romans. Okay, so I, right, we know that that's referring to Paul. You, right? So the you, let's just really quickly while we're on that, figure out, all the places where that's connected, right? It's connecting to your, here, your spiritual worship, the renewal of your mind by testing you may discern what is the will of God, right? So there we've identified the pronouns and who they're referring back to. And in the context, who is this you referring back to? Right. He identifies right here, brothers, so believers, right? So we have a verb right here. And any ideas on tense, passive, active? Right, it's active, something that Paul is doing. It's not being done to him, and it's happening right now, present tense. Okay, what else? Therefore, that's right. Let's get a different color here for this. So when we see a therefore, that's going to signal us to look backwards, right? And if we were to go back and figure out what therefore is tying this to, we would find that it's actually, he's having a huge shift in the entire book, and he's looking back at the first 11 chapters. So this is signaling to us he's now presenting his conclusions based on all the theology in the first 11 chapters. Right? Brothers is given us a who? To present your bodies as a living sacrifice. So present your bodies compared to living sacrifice. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Appeal is connected to the mercies of God. Holy and acceptable. Yeah, I mean, there's two. So usually we're looking for more than two, but we're seeing this word and that's connecting these ideas together. Um, and if we ask the what question about this, what is holy and acceptable? Present your bodies as a living sacrifice. That's right. Oh, yeah. So we have another who, right? By the mercies. What are you thinking with that? Yes. Classify that as a how. Someone just mentioned that you have a list here, right? Three things are being stated. 
So sometimes I like to write these off to the side. Um, good, acceptable, perfect. Okay, so we're, we're getting a contrast here, right? And, and what signals us to that? This word right here, right? When we see the but, we know there's a contrast involved. So what is being contrasted? Well, I mean, you could say this entire phrase right here and this entire phrase where you could break it up. You could say conformed is being contrasted to transformed. This world um, is being uh, contrasted against renewal or the renewal of your mind. So we have a contrast happening here. Do not be is an imperative. That's, gr that's good. And also, what tense is it? Present. And is it something that's happening to you or something that you have to do? Commanded to do, so it's active, right? It's not passively happening to you. Okay? Testing is a verb. Discern is a verb. Definite article, the. Not just any will, but the will. And this word of is telling us that the will is connected to God, right? But yeah, which is your spiritual worship is connected to present your bodies. Any, has anybody seen any figures of speech? Living sacrifice, right? That's not something that literally we are. We're, none of us are laying on a literal altar as animals about to have our throats cut and be burned to God, right? Like, so that is trying to, it's conveying an image. It's giving imagery, right? Yes, so this, you, you may discern what is the will of God, tells us why, one reason why we don't want to do this and we do want to do this. Just kind of in, in line with the study tonight, too, do you see the cause and effect there? What are the causes there at the end or in the latter half of this passage? So we have a cause, the renewal of your mind, and also the negative cause, right? Do not be conformed to this world. That also has to happen. We have these two causes and they're connected, right? And what is their effect? That by testing, you may discern what is the will of God. So there you have the effect. Okay, that's a good observation. So present being a verb, it's connected over here, which is your spiritual worship. So yeah, that... That would be a verb, right? Or is that a noun? Any English teachers in here? Where's Rachel at? <laughs> so that brings a lot of questions just about that one word, right? Any other thoughts? Let's get a couple more and then we'll be done. Yeah, so this is describing what the will of God is, right? This is like a what. It's not just that it's compared to it, but it's that it is. Right, but it's in the same vein as comparison. Um, one more. Who else has one that we that no one has seen yet? Okay, so that right there, we just cracked the surface, right? Now I know that it feels like, oh, how could we possibly observe more? But whenever you feel that way, think back to that story in the video we watched at the beginning of the student and the fish and the professor. And he looked at the fish, and he's like, I've seen it all. And the professor comes back, and he's like, well, you missed one of the most obvious things. So he looks at it some more, and then he begins to discover more, right? And then the professor comes back, show me what you've seen. And he's like, well, here's what I've seen. And he's like, okay, that's good, but keep looking. 
And that's the way we have to treat this because I'll tell you what, you know, like Acts 1.8 that we were going to look at tonight, you know, you feel lucky if you get 30 observations on it, but I think the all-time record is like 300-something, right, on one verse. So the point being, there's always more to see. Look, look, and look again, all right? Let's go ahead and pray and close it out. Lord, we just thank you that we get to, like, detectives, investigators, Lord, examine your word and uh, just really dive deep into it. And we know we're only scratching the surface, Lord. There's more things to see. There's more things to be on the lookout for. But Lord, I pray that as we become better observers of your word, we'd become better understanders of your word. So just help us as we go home in our our personal Bible study times and as we want to study the Bible more and and, uh, understand scripture better. Just help us to uh, have our eyes wide open um, to observe the things that are right in front of us. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So next week, observation part two. We're going to look at more things to observe.